1. So me and my roommate have a relationship where we like to pull practical jokes on each other. Last night, around 6, I come home and notice my roommate isn't home yet. However, he normally is back at our place around this time on weekend days, and he has a sort of ritual where he goes to the bathroom when he gets back to our place. So I have the then brilliant idea to scare him when he gets back by hiding behind the shower curtain and jumping out when he closes the bathroom door. So I go into the bathroom and hide behind the curtain. We have a thick shower curtain of Starry Night by Van Gogh. So you wouldn't be able to notice anybody behind it, given the dark colors. So I'm chilling there for about 15 minutes, playing games on my phone, when I hear the front door open. I immediately stand up and get ready to jump out. In the living room, I could hear my roommate, Jax, talking to his girlfriend about something slightly questionable. I did when we were out drinking the other night. Which I regret, but that story isn't too important. This is the point I'm starting to think. This is not a too hot idea because I don't want to prank him right after he was clearly talking about me in the other room. So I start praying that they just go into his room and I can slip out, silently. Well, that didn't happen. Instead, I hear one person walk into the room opposite the bathroom, Jax's room, and the other walk into the bathroom and close the door. Judging by the light footsteps, I immediately know it was my roommate's girlfriend coming in. I froze in horror as I heard the lock click. I could hear the noise of her pulling down her pants and the clink noise of the toilet seat as she sat down. Then I hear the trickling noise of pee. At this point, I was absolutely drenched in sweat. Then when it finally stopped, it was followed up by a couple of farts. I wanted to die right then and there. Then the plopping noises came. Soon after, accompanied by an unwelcoming smell, I was holding back tears of anguish. I was hoping that it would soon be over. Then I hear noises coming from her phone, which I'm assuming were snap stories. I was getting a huge headache, just wanting the ordeal to be over. But she just sat on the toilet and lingered for like 15 minutes, I'm guessing. To me, it felt like 15 hours. Then finally, I hear the rip of toilet paper and the flushing noise. I was close to being free, but not quite. She walks out of the bathroom after washing her hands and walks into my roommate's room. I was waiting for the door to close so I could quickly get the hell out of there. However, I hear her come back into the bathroom about a minute later. Again, closing the door and locking it. My life flashed before my eyes as I could hear her take off her clothes and drop them on the ground. I knew this was going to be it for me. Then I see the wall of protection in front of me, fling to the right, and my roommate's naked girlfriend was looking at me absolutely horrified. She let out a huge scream that almost ruptured my eardrums. I was bright red and didn't scream back. I just jumped out of the tub and sprinted out of my apartment. I run down the stairs and go into the main floor's public bathroom. I'm sitting in the handicap stall with my face buried in my hands. I couldn't go anywhere outside because it was cold, and I was wearing a t-shirt and gym shorts, along with socks. My phone kept ringing over and over again. I didn't look because I knew it was my roommate. He left no messages, he just kept calling me until I answered. So I finally do. And as soon as he realized I answered, he went off on me big time. It took some time to explain that I was just trying to pull a prank on him. And the worst possible scenario that could have arose happened. After his tone calmed down a bit, I went back up to my apartment and went straight to my room. I didn't shower. Didn't eat dinner. Nothing. No knocks came at my door either. I slipped out early this morning because... I didn't feel like dealing with the inevitable, awkward post-meeting after the incident. I have to go home eventually. But I'm not sure what will happen. Update. When I came home today, it was kind of awkward for a few minutes with my roommate. But once we started talking about it and I told him more of the specifics of the story, he thought it was pretty funny. 
Of course, I didn't mention the part about seeing her boobs. Hopefully, this just becomes a funny story we can reflect on. 2. I have an RV. For Thanksgiving week, my wife, daughter and I traveled to Myrtle Beach and stayed in an oceanside spot. This year, my wife's best friend from childhood and her son flew down and stayed with us, making it a bit more crowded than usual, but we enjoyed it. Wife and I slept in our bed in the back, kids slept in the bunks, wife's friends slept in the pullout in the living room. Worked out just fine. Flash to late Thursday night, I woke up not feeling great. A bit nauseous. Stomach doing backflips, kind of loopy. It got to the point that I almost woke my wife to get her to grab a garbage can because I didn't know if I'd make it to the bathroom to puke if it came to that. I eventually slipped back to sleep, only to be awoken by a strident, loud beeping alarm. My sleepy brain first tried to convince me it was just an alarm clock, but I popped up and reoriented myself and realized it was the combination carbon monoxide propane detector going off. I quickly popped out of bed and got down on my hands and knees to press the silence button. The alarm is mounted on the side of the bed frame, directly below me. While my brain tried to figure out what was going on, my immediate thought was, false alarm. These things are supposedly notoriously buggy and tend to deteriorate over time. I pulled it out and groggily read everything on it, but couldn't really tell what it was complaining about. As I continued to wake, I did a rundown of possibilities. First, I'm not feeling overly weird. Ask my wife how she feels. Nothing weird. So I don't think we're in immediate danger and need to wake everyone and air out the RV just yet. Down near the floor, I don't smell or sense any propane. The only sources of carbon monoxide at this point are the furnaces which aren't running at this time, and haven't been running, and the heat pump that has been running but can't generate any. The monitor appears to have stopped its alarm state, no more blinking red, so I go to the restroom, relieve some pressure from my still terrible stomach, then we turn off the lights and try to get back to sleep. I finally drift off and it goes off again. Well, shit. I silence it and hear stirrings from the bunks and from the front as the alarm at least briefly wakes the others. The red lights stop after only briefly appearing. Damn malfunctioning crap. Back to sleep. Again. At this point... I break the electrical connection to it. It's either malfunctioning, or there's something going on, but it continuously going off is helping no one. As an aside, this is definitely a fuck up. Please don't follow my example. I head up front to double check the oven, stove, to see if any of the fixtures might have been left on. Double check the water heater is only on electric, not propane. Check the fridge, which can also run on propane. Still nothing. I grab my phone and look up the detector model and download the PDF for the manual. This confirms that the detector is detecting propane or some combustible gas. I debate calling the fire department. It's just so goddamned inconvenient to get everyone involved. We're staying in a very large RV park, like 800 sites. We'd probably wake everyone in the world up. We'd have to evacuate the kids, air out the RV freeze outside, etc, etc, etc. And I still think it's a false alarm. I don't smell anything. The red lights go out almost immediately. It's got to be a false alarm. We talk to my wife's friend and explain the situation. Check on the kids. It's about two in the morning now and everyone is tired. We all go back to bed and I lay there awake for a while. I decide I'm just going to stay awake to make sure we get through the night. Then, I'm not sure how I didn't think of it before, I get out of bed again and go outside and turn off the propane feed to the RV from the tank. Even if there is a leak inside, it can't leak if the propane is turned off. If the tank itself is leaking, it's not going to go up into the RV. It'll sink. So it's got to be an inside leak. We should be fine until I can find the source tomorrow. I finally drop off to sleep and wake up alive 
the following morning as does everyone else. Remember kids, don't be like me. Those detectors save lives. I make my way back to Lowe's and buy a cheap handheld gas detector on Black Friday, fighting the traffic, parking and crowds like an idiot. I loathe Black Friday. And head back to track this sucker down. Long story short, I can't find anything. Frankly, I'm going to return the damned thing since it can't even detect the unlit pilot light in the oven. When I'm holding in the gas feed button, I reattach the gas detector even though I think it's malfunctioning and settle in for our day. I also order a more expensive and hopefully more reliable gas detector off Amazon to be delivered so I can once and for all track down any possible leak. And until then, just keep the propane off unless we're actually using it. Later that day it goes off again. In the daytime this time. Aha! Got you! Cheap malfunctioning crap. I pat myself on the back and convince myself that everything is okay and make plans to replace the detector. About an hour later, I think back and realize that it just went off a minute or two after I heard my wife spraying hairspray on her hair. She says, well, spray it again and see if it goes off. Brilliant idea. So, I head inside, grab her hairspray and spray two seconds worth, a bit near the detector. The detector alarms a second later. So it does appear to catch things. Hmm. My wife jokes, maybe you just tooted too much. You said your stomach felt bad. Holy shit. I really did. I must have relieved pressure in my sleep, which caused enough methane buildup to sink down to the level of the detector on the side of my bed, directly under a nice tent of covers hanging over the edge, to cause it to think everyone was going to die because of propane buildup. Not once, not twice, but three times. 3. Here's some backstory. So this fuck up just happened yesterday. It was my birthday and as tradition, I went out with some of my friends and family to celebrate it. We planned to get some tickets to the cinema and as everyone else was running late, I bought my tickets before the others and went on my way to the diner. It was no further than a five minute walk. Some friends arrived, give or take 20 minutes later. And this is when I knew shit had started to hit the fan. But before this progresses, here's where the fuck up happened. Before I went out to the diner, I was in the vicinity of some marijuana oil. I have smoked, vaped, eaten various different strains of the Mary Jane. All of which have given me zero effect as I have a high drug tolerance. I took about a teaspoon of concentrated oil. Fucking idiot, am I right? Three hours later, I was at the diner. The stages of highness. The first stage. I had a pina colada. This is when the high started to kick in. Another fuck up right here. The pina colada intensified my high. I was starting to giggle uncontrollably, even though the situation my friend was talking about was serious. I said, sorry, <laughs> give me a minute. Looked at him not long after and with a smile stuck to my face told him, Sorry, go ahead. He started talking and I started laughing. The second stage, my legs and body were starting to tingle. I was still giggling. I was spacing out and my friends were asking me if I was okay. I was. Then, the third stage. Another friend and her boyfriend had arrived. I was spacing out hardcore. My eyelids were heavy, my head was heavy and I had no control. My eyes were jumping everywhere. It was out of control. She asked me if I was high, to which I responded, no. The fourth stage. I was starting to lose it. My heart rate started going through the roof. I could feel it about to explode from my chest. My legs were pulsating and so was everything else. The fifth stage. I felt like throwing up. I kept downing water to make that feeling go away. It didn't last very long. The sixth stage, I threw up on the floor, all over my friend too. I'm sorry, dude. The seventh stage, I was dragged, I mean dragged, no control of my legs to the toilet. 
to which I rescinded in for what felt like an hour, maybe two. The toilet paper holder was my saviour. I leaned on that bitch till I heard it crack. The eighth stage. I was high as a kite. I had extreme vertigo and could not keep my eyes open. The thing is, I remember absolutely everything that happened. I scared strangers that came into the toilet, and my friends who checked up on me too. The ninth stage. I was being carried out of the toilet, by my relatives into a car. Some older folks, I was still spaced out but could hear everything, asked if they should call triple zero. The tenth stage. I was in the car, head on the back seat armrest, till I got home. The eleventh stage. I got home, spun for another few more hours. The twelfth stage. I was able to get out of bed without the spinning, watched TV for a bit, and went back to bed for eight hours. The thirteenth stage. Now, I woke up and I'm still fucking high. Uncontrollable giggle and smiling. I have to go out now too. Wish me luck. 4. It had always been my dream to have my own garden, filled with fruit trees. Moving into a house was going to accomplish that dream. Unfortunately, the house I moved into was poorly managed. So the yard was completely filled with weeds and had weak soil. I tried for a while to pull all the weeds out and replace the soil, but the yard was in such bad shape that I couldn't manage on my own. Watching me completely fill it my garden, my dad decided to give me the ultimate gardening trick, setting the entire yard on fire. His reasoning was that it would be like slash and burn agriculture, getting rid of the unwanted weeds while producing good fertilizer with the charred remains. I thought it was an awesome idea, and proceeded to buy some gasoline. So, in the middle of a dry, sunny day, I poured gasoline all over my lawn and dropped a match onto it. The lawn erupted into a great flame, but after a while the flame started to die. I poured more gasoline onto the dying flame, and it erupted back to life again. I repeated this process until the flames were big enough that I didn't need to try and revive it again. From the distance I could hear fire truck sirens, but for some dumb reason, I thought the firefighters were off to save some poor fallen elderly soul that lived in the convalescent home right next to my cul-de-sac. But lo and behold, three fire trucks and one police car come rushing into my cul-de-sac. One firefighter grabbed the hose and put out the fire full force, while the other firefighters and cop surrounded me, screaming at me to get down. In my full panic, I got down in all fours. One of the firefighters screamed, What is going on here? I answered, Slash and burn agriculture? The firefighters looked at one another like I was speaking tongues and told me, Your neighbors called and told us that it seemed like you were setting your yard on fire for some kind of cult meeting. Is this true? I looked around me and sure enough, all my neighbors were worriedly looking out their windows. Sure that I was up to no good. It took me a while for me to explain to the firefighters that I was not part of some fire-worshipping cult, and that I was only setting fire to my yard to help with my gardening. Greatly amused but satisfied with my answer, the firefighters and cop all left after giving me a hefty fine. I think my neighbours are still convinced that I'm part of a cult, or at least that I'm some sort of pyromaniac. But given that the strange Asian neighbour of theirs was gleefully watching her yard burn down, I'm not surprised. At least I'll have some nice fruit trees. 5. I had plans to meet up with some friends in Atlantic City for the weekend. I got a late start, so they were already gambling somewhere in the Taj Mahal. I had been there once before, but didn't really remember the layout except for a long escalator that led down to the casino from the lobby. I parked my car and walked quickly from the parking deck to the lobby. On my way to the lobby, there was a crowd of people gathered behind a security guard who was holding some caution tape across the hallway. He let a bunch of people in and, of course, I squeezed through as he was closing it off. That is where things went sideways. 
I saw a film camera in the lobby and thought, huh, they must be filming a commercial for the casino or something. Wonder if I'll be in it. But before I could finish that thought, everyone around me in the entire lobby froze in position. A second later, someone yells, Action! I start walking alongside a person who was next to me and ask him quietly, I'm not supposed to be here, am I? He immediately shook his head, no. So I see the escalator to the casino about 20 feet away, and two extras are about to get on it. I think to myself, if I can just get on that, it would be my escape from ruining whatever they're doing in the lobby. I make a move, get on the escalator, and start taking a few steps down. Success! I didn't screw anything up. After a few more steps, I catch up to those two people who got on the escalator before me. And they're blocking the full width and not walking, I mean, come on. Only at this point do I see the boom microphone, the camera panning down with them, and the crowd of 150 spectators at the bottom of the escalator. Then someone yells, CUT! And the two people in front of me turn around. Turns out those two jerks blocking the escalator were Jennifer Aniston and Gerard Butler. And I completely blew up their scene. There was nothing I could do, I just said, uh, I'm sorry. I figured there was no point in explaining my series of bad decisions. Butler laughed, and we completed the rest of the very long escalator ride in awkward silence. Hey everyone, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to 5 True Embarrassing Stories, episode 22. As usual, of course, I'd like to say thank you very much to everyone who was kind enough to share their embarrassing experiences with us. It is very greatly appreciated. I'd also like to take a moment to thank everyone, especially unit number 522, for their hard work in getting rid of Mr. Scary from this site. Unit 522, you are a far braver man than I, and I am very grateful for what you did. If you guys haven't actually checked out his channel, then I'm going to put a link in the description, so please do head on over and check him out, and maybe subscribe if you aren't already subscribed. He certainly deserves it. And with that, I'm going to head off for now, so until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.